Well, welcome, and let's have a word of prayer, and we'll begin our class. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we thank you that in the deepest sense of the word, it is truly a day that you have made. And it's a day that we can commit ourselves to you, knowing that you will lead us and guide us throughout this day, no matter what it is uh, that takes place in our life. <clears throat> we, can, uh, we can lean ourselves on you and trust ourselves to you. You can give us a peace that passes all understanding, as we will learn later, and you can guide us in all that we do, knowing that all of our circumstances are, in the end, ultimately controlled by you. We thank you for the time that we can have together in your word of truth this morning, and Lord, thy word is truth. Sanctify us in truth, that we might live for your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray, amen. Well, I got to thinking about, in fact, if you'll turn back to Jeremiah chapter 29 as, as we are um, continuing in, in Philippians, and uh, you'll recall, in fact, this may, um, um, this may be, go back a couple of set, uh, sessions, but I, um, oh yeah, I forgot there is an outline here, <laughs> and we'll get to that for uh, in a moment. Uh, but you'll recall that Paul says in, um, in, in chapter 2, verses 14 and on, do, not, do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. And I, and I thought more about that. Now, I know that we, have, uh, we, we were in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, but I got to thinking about that again and how important that is to us. God had put the nation in captivity. He told them they were going to be there 70 years in Babylon. And um, <clears throat> if, if, if you, we'll pick it up again in verse 4, because this, to me, gives some key principles on how we in a world that we don't, which sometimes I think, boy, I wish I were not in this world right now, but I am. And it's amazing what God did here with this, with the nation, because he says in verse 4, Jeremiah does, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent uh, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, this was a traumatic experience for these people. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens, and eat their, uh, eat their produce. Take wives, and become uh, fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, and multiply there, and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city. That's Babylon. <laughs> Think about that. <clears throat> Where I have sent you in exile, and, uh, exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its well welfare, you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you and do not listen to the, uh, to the dreams which they dream. Now, you'd have to go through the rest of the chapter, which is quite lengthy, mm -hmm. to realize that these false prophets say, we're only going to be here a couple days, so don't worry about it. God says, no, you're going to be there 70 years. Don't listen to them, he says. So in verse 10, he says, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Now, if we had time, we could go back to first, uh, Second Kings, beginning in chapter 17, and realize why they got sent to captivity. And the very things that God told them not to do, they did. And uh, finally, they, and, and he sent his prophets to them, warned them time and time again, and they wouldn't listen. And so finally, of course, uh, the northern kingdom had already been taken to captivity by Assyria in 722 B.C. It was ugly. I would encourage you to read those chapters, chapter 17 through um, chapter 25 in, in 2 Kings, and that will give you a picture of where we're at here in Jeremiah chapter 29. So, uh, I will visit you, I'll bring you back. In verse 11, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. 
I would think that every day they lived their lives, they might feel hopeless. But these were promises God had given to the nation and to the people. And then he says in, in verse 12, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes. I will gather you from all the nations. And by the way, this, this really, verse 14, is speaking of that time at the end. This is not because they only came back from one nation. Uh, when they came back from Babylonia, not all the nations. There will come a time when, when God will bring them all back. And that's what verse 14 is uh, uh, talking about. I'll restore your fortunes. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, de declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. Now, I don't want to give you any preview here, but in September we're going to start a series on the difference between what our church believes, it's called dispensationalism, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the difference between that and covenant theology. And uh, uh, there, are, there are many who believe that God will not bring the nation back at the end. So, of course, you will have to go through tribulations and all the rest. So, as I looked at this, as we get back to Philippians chapter 3, actually is where we're going to be this morning, I made a list for me. And uh, you just get to listen on how I should live my life in the mess we're living in today, in the world we live. And as I, as I looked at that text, the first thing I noticed is live life as normal as you can and put up with inconveniences, and I put it at the end, without complaining. And frankly, I need to stop doing that. Because either God has, has, is doing the same work in me that he did for the nation, just live your life normally as best you can. Secondly, be patient. Because God is still God. And his timing, you, it, it, we all look at our watches, but God's, God doesn't wear the same watch we wear, right? He doesn't. And so... Um, <clears throat> And then I put in there, be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Really, that's what Paul is saying in, in chapter uh, 2, verse 16, uh, that you need to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. No matter what we may think, they need us. The unbelieving world needs us. Now, does that mean they're going to respond? No, but they're going to see a difference. Thirdly, trust God. And we do live in exile, right? I mean, really, in a sense, we do. And so, God, uh, and, and I should remember, God still thinks about me. Even though he had sent them to captivity, he had them on his mind. He wasn't going to give up on the nation. He never has. So, he's planning for me. And no matter how difficult your situation may do, don't waste your suffering by resisting God. And that's a hard one sometimes for me to wrap my hands around or my heart around. But finally I get to the point where I have to admit that God, you're God and I am not. And in the end, you in some sovereign Way allowed these me to live in this period in history. And finally, and maybe most importantly, don't uh, avoid false hopes. Listen, if Israel had false teachers, and she did, or prophets, we have our false teachers, and they say the same thing. There hasn't been any changes over false prophets all these years, and we have them today. They're all over the place. Uh, and, and, and you know what? It is human to indulge in false hopes. But that's not God's plans for us. So don't listen to all the subtle voices of false, te false teachers running around out there that's giving all kinds of false weather forecasts and false hopes. Right here is our guide. This and this only. 
And um, I don't need to, I've already named names, so you, you don't need me to repeat those names for you, but they are all over the place. They're, uh, they're uh, on television day after day after day, giving all kinds of false prophecies, false hopes, false this, false that. God's word is our key. And so that's what he was telling the, um, telling those who were, were in exile. Don't listen to them. You keep listening to them. They keep lying to you. I not send them. And I can guarantee you this. He didn't send Bill Johnson. He didn't send Stephen Furtick and all that list of false prophets who are out there today. And, 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 I, and I won't say any more names. So those are some things that I gleaned from that great passage. Now, mind you, we need to remember that was specific to Israel. But there's still a greater purpose there for all of us as well and principles. Any questions? I guess the hardest part of it all is just live your life normal. And maybe don't watch the news. <laughs> I guess that's... So if, if you're like me, it gets in my way so much. Well, we move on to chapter 3. Believe it or not, we've made it that far. And we're just going to look at a few verses here. Uh, there's an amazing change in Paul's attitude. And uh, we'll see what that is. But he says, finally, my brethren, and that, that's not a conclusion. That's just a transition to a different topic. He says, uh, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware, uh, aware of, the, uh, of false, the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship uh, in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So all of a sudden, Paul's tone has changed. And, and you wonder, because, you know, when we, when we finish chapter 2, he is giving a great account of Timothy and Epaphroditus and how much they had helped him. Uh, while, you know, of course, Epaphroditus was the one who brought their love gift to him from the church. We find that out in chapter 4. And he stayed to minister to Paul. Timothy, of course, uh, Paul picked him up in Acts chapter 16 when he began his second missionary journey, and he was with him all the way to Rome. And uh, uh, he was like a child in the faith. And so that is all very positive. But all of a sudden, um, there's a change in his attitude. Look with me in Galatians chapter 1, because I think we get a picture of what's going on here with Paul. Galatians chapter 1. And I'm just going to read verses uh, 6 and following. Paul says, I'm amazed. He's stunned. Is everybody there? I'm sorry. Galatians 1. Just back a few pages, actually. <clears throat> I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. Now, him is the living God who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary uh, to what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I, I say again, now, if any man is preaching you a gospel contrary to what he re, uh, you received, he is to be accursed. Well, as we go back to Philippians chapter 2, that's what was going on. And some, Paul is simply saying somebody's messing with the gospel. And he was not going to have that. He wasn't going to put up with that. By the way, a different gospel is no gospel at all, right? And in the Galatians case, and we'll see that here, because part of that is what's going on here in Philippi, <clears throat> is that it was, it, it was a gospel of works plus grace, or a grace plus works. And it, it really, it, was, um, it had to do with circumcision. So, um, as I looked at the text, I said, how can we tell the difference? How do we really know the difference between what the real gospel is? How can we recognize a false gospel or a false religion? I can tell you one way is to know the truth really well, the true one. You know, that's just like counterfeit money. 
Uh, some years back, there was a there was a, um, a huge conference, maybe out in California. That'd be a good place to start, where they uh, a bunch of bankers and uh, tellers and all those people came together for one month to learn about counterfeit money. And do you know that during the, that during that thirty days, they never looked at one counterfeit bill. They spent their whole time looking at the real thing. And by the time they real, uh, understood what, what was the real thing, they could spot a phony one instantly. So in a sense, that's what we should do. We know the gospel, and we ought to know it so well that anything that's different from that, as Paul says, stay away from it. That's not the true gospel. So what are the, what are the qualities of, uh, of true believers? Well, first of all, he says, uh, they rejoice in the Lord. By the way, not my circumstances. I rejoice in Christ, right? Not my circumstances. I rejoice in Him. Because my circumstances may not be all that good. Paul's wasn't, right? He's in prison. But he's so, he's, he is so upbeat about where he's at and what's going on. You remember in chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 12, Now I want you to know, brother, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. So Paul's circumstances weren't good. He was down at the bottom of the palace in a dungeon. And way up there was the guy that ran things, Caesar. His name was Nero. And yet, Paul says, rejoice in Christ, not my circumstances. Not happiness. Why not happiness? Why can't we rejoice in happiness? Happiness is circumstance. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they change constantly. They change. Um, but Christ never changes. So that, and so my circumstances are always going to be dictated by how favorable they are. If they're not favorable, then of course I'm not going to be all that happy, right? Now, it may be different for you, but it, certainly I've found that out myself. But <clears throat> joy will persist no matter what my circumstance is because God has given me joy deep within me. When I came to Christ, uh, joy began to work in my heart and life. And by the way, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. So uh, <clears throat> biblical joy uh, gives a, a deep, confidence in the midst of whatever's going on in my life. Um, you might jot this down. Let me read it for you. So Psalm, Psalm 1611 is one of my very favorite psalms. The psalmist writes, uh, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Now that's a promise. It's just not ink on a piece of paper. It's a promise from the living God himself. In your presence is fullness of joy. And uh, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ in, in John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. Not about you, but if you follow the history of the disciples after Christ made that statement, things weren't all that good for them, right? The cross was, uh, they were in the uh, shadow of the cross. Christ had already told them that they were going to scatter. Their lives were completely turned upside down, and yet he makes that promise to them. And he makes it to us as well. So, so that is, uh, that is uh, some... Some, uh, some promises given to those who, um, by the way, you can break in any time. If you have any thoughts or anything uh, about that. So, but he says, rejoice in the Lord, not your circumstances. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to practice, and I think I have these things on my outline, or whatever the outline was I sent, uh, but uh, practice discernment. He says, to write the same things again to you is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. By the way, Peter says essentially the same thing in 1 Peter. 
that I write to say, you know, some people, some people say, well, why do they keep repeating themselves? Because we need it. We need it. <clears throat> and so um, uh, discernment is just like faith. It needs to grow. We need to understand. It. Look with me in, in, in uh, just turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> but discernment is something that we grow in. And a new believer lacks discernment. And it's very difficult for them to spot the phony. And that's why I, I, I am passionate about discipling a new believer. And um, I did that for years now. It's been a while since I've done that. But listen, there's no greater joy than having the opportunity to come alongside a brand new believer in Jesus Christ and uh, begin to work with that person and help them begin to, to uh, build their faith in Christ. And so Paul says in, um, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some as apostles, some as, as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So we, we tend to think that since they're the professionals, they, they're the ones that do all the work. Not true. That's so far from the truth, and yet we, you know, that's, that's what Roman Catholicism is built on. But notice what he says in verse 12, for equipping of the saints for the work of the service to the building of the body of Christ until we all, notice, attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, verse 14, we are no longer to be children. That, by the way, that word in the Greek has to do with the baby that it has to be carried around everywhere they go. That's a new believer, a picture of a new believer. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and by craftiness and deceitful scheming. If that does not paint a picture of where we're at today in evangelicalism, I don't know what does. They flit from one teacher to the next. They never get settled in their faith. And frankly, I've said this before, and I'll say it till my tongue rots out. The church has failed new believers. Not all, and certainly not this church. But so many churches think, well, you know, I, I, um, we used to have an um, Easter service um, where I pastored years ago. Uh, and uh, fundamentalist pastors, we had a fellowship. And they would, they would uh, go to different churches every year. And I had a friend from another church, and we hadn't seen each other for a while. We hugged, and he asked me how I was doing. And I, and I told him, I said, well, I said, <laughs> I, said I, I need to back off some, say, some things. He said, I, I think I was discipling maybe, maybe then 10 or so people in different times, in different locations. And he said, oh, I, he said, I don't do that. He said, I just get them in the kingdom. I was heartbroken. Now, I didn't say one word to him, not one word, because we were friends, but that's not right. You cannot do that. You wouldn't do that with your children, would you? You would grow your little children up, wouldn't you? You want to get them off of milk sooner or later, don't you? But we, for some reason, we don't do that with new believers. And Paul is laying it down here. He says, as a result, we're no longer to be children. And he, by the way, he doesn't give the responsibility to the pastors. It's to all of us. So anyway, that's just my own thought. And Paul is saying that here. You've got to have discernment. You have to have discernment. False teachers are everywhere. Uh, let me just read. Uh, you don't need to turn here. Just jot this one down too as well, if you will. Acts 20, verses 28 through 31. Paul says, and by the way, he did this in tears as he left the elders in Ephesus, as he was leaving Ephesus. He says in, in Acts 20, 25, And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. If you finish this chapter out, they were crushed. They were going to lose Paul. In fact, Timothy, when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he says, I can recall your tears. And those were tears they all shed when, when Paul made that statement. In verse 27, he says, For I did not sh uh, shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. 
Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among whom, uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now think about that. Christ shed his blood for the church. And he says in verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in uh, among you, not sparing the flock. And, um, and now, now notice verse 30. This is sobering. From among your own selves, men will arise uh, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Why? Well, if you read the history of the church at Ephesus, you realize that they were warned four more times after Paul left. And in a sense, they didn't get it right. Timothy became the pastor of that church. And uh, Paul had to warn him about men who were speaking perverse things, even then. So if new believers don't have discernment, uh, they're just left for all kinds of false teaching. So he says, don't be alarmed by them. They're coming. Who are they? <laughs> well, here, here's something to feast on in verse 2 beware, beware of the dogs you realize he's speaking of Jews what did Jews call Gentiles dogs what is Paul saying are they dogs so are these teachers he says by the way the, the literal dogs ran all over the place there were, there were nasty dogs over Jerusalem and other cities around the, in that time and uh, they were scavengers and they would, you get near them and they would bite you in a heartbeat. That's what Paul is saying about these false teachers. Are, and so Paul is saying, are they filthy? <laughs> so are these false teachers. So are they. Um, and he uses this image to, uh, to, to give us a, 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 a picture of us. And by the way, they're snarling legalists. That's what's going on here in this one at, at this time. Uh, look with me in Acts chapter 13. Because this started all the way back in Acts chapter 13 and actually before that. And uh, this is what got, uh, this is what uh, the Israel, uh, that is the Jews, who rejected Christ, struggled so much, so hard with. Because we'll find out for them, circumcision was everything by the time Paul came on the scene in that day. It was a test of salvation, which it was never given by God for that. So in Acts 13, 39, or 38 and 39, Paul is in Antioch. And he gives this whole great treatise uh, beginning uh, almost at the beginning of the chapter. But we just want to pick it up in verses 38 and 39. Um, he says, uh, it, Paul says to the, to, to the Jews, Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness, that is through Christ, him forgiveness of sin is, it, sins is proclaimed to you, and that through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Now, we, we, we're here today. This, this is 2023. We know why, why you couldn't be freed by the law, right? Because that was not its purpose. The law can't save anyone. It can, it can point out your sin to you, but it cannot do anything to change your heart. So... Pick it up again in chapter 15. Now, Paul has, Paul has gone back to Antioch after his first missionary journey. And it's just like reporting. He, he's a missionary reporting to uh, Delaware Bible Church, whoever you might want to choose. And so in Acts chapter 14 and uh, verse 26, we read, From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them, and now he, how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time there with the disciples. Keep in mind, long time. Now, have, how long it was? I don't know. I have no idea. I, all I know, it was a long time. Now, chapter 15. 
Verse 1, so men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Whoa, that's like blowing the roof off this church, doctrinally. And Paul exploded. And so in, 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 in verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of them would go to, uh, should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Now I would encourage you to become really familiar with Acts chapter 15 because the heart of the gospel is in this chapter. If Paul doesn't win this case, you and I aren't here this morning. It's that simple and that critical. So in verse 4 we read, when, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed, notice, stood up, saying, it, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And notice, by the way, th this is a perfect church meeting, by the way, because sometimes you have lots of discussions at church meetings, right? Sometimes if someone is not a mediator, it can get a little bit out of control. I've been there. Um, and that's what it says. Uh, in verse 7, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Notice carefully what Peter says. And said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you by, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. That was a, a, an incredible period. And that's when, of course, he went to Cornelius. And his household was saved. And they received the Holy Spirit just as the Jews did. Wait a minute, Gentiles? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's what it was. So in verse 9, he says, in verse 9, he says, made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they all, uh, also are. And, and then, of course, uh, they, they made their decision. They wrote letters to the Gentile churches. They asked them to observe certain things uh, 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 that were unfavorable to the Jews simply because they, uh, the Jews didn't practice those things. All of, and, and listen, that's how Paul started his second missionary journey with those letters. But if, it's not, if the gospel is not one there, you and I are not here this morning. It's that simple. That's how critical that council was. Now, why do I go for so long with that? Because that's what Paul is talking about in Philippians 2, or 3. Incidentally, just one side thought here. If Peter was the first pope, as many say he is, why didn't, why didn't he run things in the most important council in the history of the church? He didn't. It was James. That's just a side thought. Free for nothing. Look, uh, Peter never said he was a pope, by the way, did he? Never said he was a pope. Well, we go back to chapter 3 then in, in Philippians. But just, to, just we need to understand, I think, historically, where the gospel started and how it worked in the early days of the church. Because they dogged Paul wherever he went. So, um, beware of evil workers. They corrupt the gospel. People saved through faith plus good works. And listen, we keep doing that time and time again, don't we? We keep adding things to the gospel for us. I must, I'm, somehow I must think I have to do something extra to satisfy God. I can't do any more than what he did for me, Right? And so that's what Paul's saying. He, God, God does not want us laboring under shame and guilt over what, what more I can do for him. And that's what Paul is saying. He wants them to rejoice. Now, now some would say, well, Paul's hard here. Listen, he's just practicing Ephesians 4.15, speaking, uh, speaking the truth in love. 
And sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we have to say, wait a minute, you're wrong. Let me show you why you're wrong. Their false circumcision, notice. Uh, and look, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 17 with me, if you would, please. I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but this is critical. It's critical for us to see about where we're at today and where all this came from. Because by the time Paul came on the scene, circumcision was everything to the Jews. It, to them, it became a test of salvation. If I'm circumcised, I'm going to make heaven. No, you're not. And really, as, as the living God talks to, um, to um, Abraham in, in, in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12, as he's already made the Abrahamic covenant and promised him and already actually ratified it in Genesis 15, the everlasting covenant, the, what we call the Abrahamic covenant, here's how a person will, will be able to be distinguished that they are part of the covenant community. In, in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12, the Lord God says, Every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generation. A servant who is born in the house or uh, who is bought uh, with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. All of them. In verse 14, but an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, he is simply saying there, they're not part of the covenant community. That, that is the nation of Israel. But as, but as, time, as time went along, uh, they unfortunately became a test of uh, of. Um, of actual salvation and spirituality to them. Look at Deut Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is just a physical act, if you will, a separation of skin. But notice in, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16. And this is to the this is to the, the next generation. He says, so, so circumcise your heart and stiffen your necks no longer. See, God wanted their hearts. In Jeremiah chapter 4, and you don't need to turn there, but uh, in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, he says essentially the same thing. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. Men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, or else my wrath will go forth like fire and birth, burn, um, burn with none to quench it because of, the, of, the evil, uh, of your evil deeds. So they were putting all their marbles in one basket, a physical circumcision. And all that was was a, pic a picture of, of spiritual circumcision of the heart. Can we all see that? Now turn with me to Romans chapter 2. And then you will see why Paul is so um, strong about what he is saying. By the way, we should, <laughs> well, that's for another time. But Paul, Paul, uses, Paul uses all of chapter 4 of Romans. And he uses Abraham as, as, a, uh, as an example of justification by faith. Even in Romans chapter 4, he says that, that he was justified before he was circumcised. Well, the Jews weren't going to have that, and so Paul had to explain that to them. In chapter two, Romans chapter 2 and verse 25, we'll read uh, to the end of the chapter. Uh, For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, Supposing I kept the law perfectly except in one instance, what does that mean? As James tells us, you're a lawbreaker. You broke it all. No one can keep the law. No one except one person who ever lived. That's what Paul's saying. You, you need to understand it. He says in verse 27, and he who is physically uncircumcised, talking about Gentiles, by the way, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you? who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are transgressor of the law? 
Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is, uh, is that of, uh, which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Now, you talk, you, you talk about causing a problem. Paul just did. But they had to understand that circumcision, the physical act itself, was simply a promise and a guarantee that they were in the covenant community. It had nothing to do with salvation. And Paul, as we go back, back to Romans chapter 3, he says, Beware the dogs, beware the evil workers, beware the false circumcision. And incidentally, they were selling that bill of goods to the church of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul says, If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. You have severed yourself from Christ. Doesn't mean they lost their salvation, but Christ cannot help them. And either Jesus Christ came into my life when I got saved and transformed me, or he did not. And if he did not, then the only way I can, the only way I can commend myself to God is do what? all kinds of good works and hope I can make it, right? It's that famous balance of scales up in the sky. Problem is we can't see those scales. So we don't know if our good works has got it balanced out on, on both sides or, or so. And that's what Paul is saying. And that's what we need, we need to know that, that, that they're false circumcision, that no outward religious right will ever make any of us more spiritual. Right? I'm made spiritual by the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and only Him. And uh, um, it, it's sad. Um, my wife and I went to a uh, Catholic wedding some time back. Now, I can't remember if we'd ever been in one of the churches or not, but it, I mean, I, I was stunned. Even as much as I think I know about Catholicism, I don't know squat. Because they keep adding to everything they do, right? You can go to one Catholic church over here, and they do all this stuff. And then you go to this one, and they do something different. But it's all man-made religion. It counts for nothing. And that's what Paul is saying. In fact, look with me in Galatians chapter 2. I mean, listen, Paul was not ever going to let anybody mess with the gospel. And we shouldn't either. And so he is, he's, incidentally, the church of Galatia didn't actually, they were on the way of doing these things. They didn't actually do it. I mean, they had, you know, they, they had started listening to these false teachers. Um, in, in Galatians chapter 2, in verse 4. But it was because of the false brethren secret it was because uh, of the false brethren secretly, secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. Now the test case was just before that. They wanted Titus to be circumcised. Sneaked in. And that's how they work. And we have mirror word today. I mean, the gospel is becoming so confused today, we have no clue what it is. And Paul is saying, and that's, now you know why he changed his tone. Well, true worshipers in verse 3. We are the true circumcision. And notice what we do. First of all, we worship in the Spirit of God. And he's the one who leads our worship service, right? It's the Spirit of God who actually leads our worship service. And, and I'm talking about me individually. He's the one who does the work. And then he says, um, he says, glory in Christ Jesus. He's our whole life. He's the very air that we breathe. It's Jesus Christ and him alone. Um, <clears throat> Scavengers would not have us do that. They, they would have us 
do all kinds of rituals in order to get to the living God himself. So we worship in the spirit. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't, it doesn't involve my technique. It doesn't involve my method or my methods. God is interested in the posture of my heart. Not whether I run around the auditorium on the outside of the auditorium or run around clapping my hands. That is not it at all. He wants to know what the posture of my heart is. And we'll see that in uh, John chapter 4 here in a moment. So, um, in fact, turn with me to John chapter 4. You remember the woman at the well? This is, this is one of my favorite chapters. I mean, you know, she, was a, she had two strikes against her, right? She was a woman. And she was a Samaritan woman. Now, we all know what this... I assume everybody knows who a Samaritan was, right? Um... Let me, let me start with uh, just early verses here in uh, John chapter 4 and verse 7. That a woman uh, of Samaria came to draw water. Christ, of course, had sat down. He was weary. And said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. That's divine timing, by the way. They needed to be gone. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And, and you'll recall that um, when, when, uh, when uh, the northern kingdom went into uh, captivity in uh, 722 B.C., uh, into Assyria, uh, during that time, Sargon too, and you'll find that out in chapter in. Uh, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 17 and following, he, pu he brought outside people in to mix with the Jews. And the Jews did the very thing God warned them not to do. You remember what they did? They intermarried with those people. So if you were to read Ezra chapter 4 verses 1 and 2, when they went back to rebuild the temple, some of the Samaritans came and wanted to help. You, you, we have nothing to do with you. And you have nothing to do with us. Stay away from us. Because they had intermarried with uh, pagan nations. So she's one of them. <laughs> and she, and, and, but Christ was on a divine clock. And he came specifically for her. And that's why she asks the question. In verse 10 he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have, would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And, and the whole process goes on. Remember, he asked, he asked her to go get her husband. What'd she tell him? I don't have one. Well, no, you don't, but you've had five. And the guy you're living with is not your husband. And by the way, how do, you, how do you know that? How do you know she had had five husbands? Yep, it's another perfect picture of his omniscience breaking through. So, and she keeps trying to change this, the subject as time goes along. This is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful story. I wish we had time of it. But in verse 4 of 20, it says, who, and she's just thinking about real water, just like you and me. The sparkling water you buy on the market, you know, you think is perfect in every way. Well, that's what she thought she was getting. But he says in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that, that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now look, ultimately he is speaking, referring to the Holy Spirit. In John 7, 37 through 39, he says the very same thing. Um, <clears throat> if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, step by step by step, he leads uh, to himself. In, um, in verse um, 19, she says, wow, I think you're a prophet. See how she's moving along here? 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now look, just, just as a side note, the Samaritans worshipped at Mount Gerizim. They had their own false worship. They only acknowledged the first five books of the Old Testament. There was animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. Bad animosity. And um, so that's, that's what she is referring to. The place where she's uh, referring to is, and by the way, that when, remember when, when, when the Samaritans got saved in Acts? That was another incredible period of history. So, and that's what God is doing here. And he says, uh, our fathers wor worshipped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, woman, by the way, that was a term of endearment. Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers notice, this ties right in with Philippians, uh, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, who seeks, who's seeking us? The living God himself. So, it, listen, this, this, is, this, this is great. Um, that's who he seeks. God is spirit. God is not confined to a body. Like you and me. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So actually, in the end, we should, we should do a great study on God's attributes. Because that's the best way I know that we can get to know what he's like and how he has acted in history. Some people say, well, if he's a spirit, how in the world can I ever worship him? Because you worship him from your innermost being, right? Way down in here where my life radiates from. It is not techniques. It is not, it is not yelling and jumping and shouting and all of those things. Now look, I'm not telling you, by the way, that there is not an emotional aspect to worship, because there is, isn't there? If it involves my whole inner being, of course there would be. And that's what the Lord is saying to her. She says, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is he was called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And wow, I who speak to you am he. Now look, we, we can't go any farther here, but you realize that she told all the people of the village, guess what? I just met a guy that told me everything about me. And she got saved. And the whole village got saved, right? All of them. So, as you go back to, as we go back to Philippians chapter 3, that's what Paul is seeking to get across, what true worship is really about. It has nothing to do the, with the outer. It has to do with the inner. So he says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. How do we know a church is Spirit-filled? Because the spotlight of that church is on Jesus Christ. That's what the Spirit does. He never came to start a Holy Spirit ministry. He came to put Christ on center stage. He shall take of mine and disclose it to you. Christ said in John 16. And so Paul is acknowledging the very same thing. Um, it's based on the truth of salvation, worship. We, we worship him, him in obedience to, your, your, uh, to his word. I don't know about you, but I've had those times when, when I would, would be doing my devotions, and, and, and I might be in a specific passage of scripture, and I'll look at that passage and say, well, that, that's a tough deal for him. And then all of a sudden I'll realize, wait a minute, he's speaking to me. And then all of a sudden, God the Holy Spirit does work inside me. And there may be something in my life that is, uh, that is, that is not right spiritually. Well, that's, how, that's what worship is. Our whole worship is, is centered on a person. And so what we think about God 
He's not a cosmic slot machine. He's not the grand old man. And, and all of these other side names that people have given him, he is the living, awesome, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent God. And the, the amazing thing is, is he wants to have a, an intimate relationship with everyone in this room. That boggles my mind sometimes when I think about that. Read the Psalms. Over and over and over again, the psalmist uh, uh, talks about his worship of the living God and um, what he can do for him. By the way, part of worship is, is, doing, is doing some things. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, and I think we may have mentioned this before, uh, the writer says in Hebrews 13 verse 15, um, through him then, through him, Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is a fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So my worship has many, uh, has many aspects to it. Along with my, you know, normal worship, that is where I just get along with the Lord and spend time with Him and spend time in His Word and allow it to do its work in my heart and life. By the way, the Word will do that, won't it? That's why it's living and active. And it exposes flaws in me. <laughs> and uh, uh, isn't, isn't that what the writer to Hebrews says again in chapter 4 and verse 12? The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's way sharper than that scalpel a surgeon is going to use on you. And um, uh, piercing as far as the of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that's what the Word does. As we're worshiping God and... Um, um, allowing the Word to do its work in me. Oh, by the way, don't leave out verse 13. There's no creature hidden from His sight, but all things, all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Or literally in the Greek, with whom we will stand in judgment. I think sometimes I'm guilty. I, I'm sure you're not. Of thinking, of thinking God is, is not going to clean all this mess up that I'm living in. And then somehow he's, go, he's gone off somewhere over there and he's waiting for things to... He's sitting over there, you know, sh wringing his hands, trying to figure out, what am I going to do next? By the way, if you think I'm wrong about that, look at, just Google open theology someday. You ever, anybody heard about that one? Well, it's gripped evangelicalism the last 10 or 15 years that God does not know the future free acts of his people. That's just part of it. And you've got several Pied Pipers out there trying to sell that crazy thing. That's not the God I know. And that's not the God that, uh, that I can sit here and in the back of my mind think, I wonder if God really knows what's going on here. I mean, all this stuff that's going on on our edge, I wonder if he knows well, listen, I'll tell you who would be a great guy to ask, Nebuchadnezzar. Ask him. When he said, you're, 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 you're done, your reign's over, you're going to go live like a cow for a few years. <laughs> I mean, God knows everything, past, present, and future. And he doesn't need me to help him, Right? <laughs> so, well, anyway, that's just whatever. Philippians chapter 3. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. We have been sidetracked by so much false stuff out there today. It's, it's just utterly amazing. You people who have been in this church for a while are fortunate to be a part of a church, that this book right here is everything and not anything else. Because I'm telling you, they're, they're changing this book daily. False teachers, daily. What they're, and that's what Paul is saying. Stay away from them. Stay away. That's what, that's what Jude said. Remember, certain men have crept in unnoticed. How could that happen? Well, it did. Somebody was asleep, asleep at, the, at the switch. 
We are the true circumcision. By the way, you can, you can study these passages for yourself and see where you fit in. I can. Who worship in the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus. And by the way, the last one is we don't put any confidence in our flesh, and that's my old self. That somehow, some way, sometimes I love to stroke it. You understand that we have the old nature and he's going to stick around until we go to see Christ, to be with Christ, right? And he's always trying to sidetrack me. He wants his own way, my, my old self. And, and unfortunately, sometimes he sort of wins. And Paul is saying, saying, listen, we put no confidence in the flesh, none, zero. Why? Because we have the, we have the third person of Trinity indwelling us who will continue to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. Look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and then we'll close it with I love this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And then we close. But we all, with unveiled face, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord of the Spirit. And that is exactly his great desire for all of us, is to keep transforming us moment by moment, day by day in his image. And if we get sidetracked from that, it's going to be difficult for him to do that work in my life. Father, we thank you for this time together. What a, what a glorious uh, time it is for us, Lord, to learn from your word of truth what true worship is all about. It, it begins and ends with you. It's, not, about, it, it's n not ever about me. It's always about you. That's what worship is. When you drew me to your son, Jesus Christ, Christ uh, self died. Doesn't mean it went away. And it doesn't mean it won't get in my way, but one thing we know, one thing, is that you want us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Because in doing so, we acknowledge you as God of our lives and no one else. And we're not going to listen to anyone else but you through your word of truth. So thank you for that. And we pray it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. 318. Uh-huh.